Mr. Showbiz himself, Strictly's Anton de Beck, joins us on this week's How to Be 60. He's discovered there's more to life than glitter balls. One of my favourite things in the world is brushing my daughter's hair. Darling, let me go and brush your hair. Oh, OK. This is her six-year-old. And she'll stand in front of me and I'll, and I'll brush her hair. I love that. And I'm wondering how to be 60. It's scaring the shit out of me. Greetings one and all to another dose of How To Be 60. Adams and McKenzie reporting for duty. Now in honour of Anton de Beck, mm-hmm. I'm wearing an old ball gown I found in a charity shop. Uh, Karen is wearing the old slappers, no sorry, flappers outfit uh, <laughs> that she wore for her starring role as drunk number three in the Giffnick Players production of The Great Gatsby. <laughs> Miss B. Dicker. <laughs> Whatever happened to, what happened to doing like, like the amateur dramatic stuff? Did you give up? Or did it give you up? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? No, I've joined for another year, but I'll, I'll just go back to um, Pete and the backdrops and whatnot. Oh, you're not, I'll help out in the you night. Don't, the you tickets. don't think you're, you're born for stardom? No, nah, I wasn't from boredom. No? No, no, no. So you can say what you like about me being the monster that you're creating, but no, it's not for... No, no. No, no, no. No. I've been in the background. Well, we need a sense of occasion for Anton. Oh, yeah. He is Mr. Twinkle Toes, Mr. Yes. Razzmatazz. Yes, yes. Um, played the London Palladium and goodness knows where else. So you've got to keep it up. I know, okay? I know, so I know. I, I, I thought, Positive. What can we do joy. to have a sense of excitement that's really going to grab Anton? You I know, be myself. The man that's used to, well, I don't think that's going to work. So I thought that this would be the occasion to open your tub of sweet pickled Oh, you mentioned that. Sweet cucumber week. pickle. Don't spill it all over the place. Your homemade cucumber pickle. He's going to be very excited about this. He really is. Oh, Jesus Christ, I, I can't open it. Oh, is fuck. that your old oh, hands? Oh, my God. Oh, oh is this my old hands? Your old hands. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh I spilled oh, the bugger. Seeds. Oh, terrible. <laughs> what a mess. Right, I've got one oat cake. Now, you've this got looks a plate like worms. with two oat cakes, two dried out oat cakes. And cheese that looks like crystallised pineapple. It's very expensive cheese, this, you know. Che- it how is, old is it, Key? It, it's Antica cheese. Antica. It's Antica oh, from you Italy. Know. Right, I'm going to put some of your pickled worms. Do I get a plate? Onto the cheese. I've only got one plate. You can have that other oat cake if you like. Let what? me try it. Mm-hmm. 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 Actually. Cheese, thanks a bunch. That's going to be, that stain's going to be there. That's a hell of a never coming out. No, it's it? never coming out. Will you? Eat, cucumber. I mean... Do you know what? Oh my god, this cheese is gross. It's quite pleasant, this quite sweet pleasant. cucumber pickle. Mm-hmm. But who could be arsed? You could buy that in a delicatessen. I mean, look, it's the joy I get from making that it. That will last you until two thousand and twenty-six. No, how wouldn't. many jars of that? Not on a salad, quite a few. You put it. I've got a you lot of cucumbers. It gives us away. Look at it. I have. I've given it to you. What the heck? It's got stuck in my. Tooth. It's got. That's very oh attractive. God. That's the dry oat cake. Oh. And the even drier old cheese. You're never going to get rid of that. How many jars have you got? Mm, maybe half a dozen. You will die before those um, jars are eaten. Okay, you're so wrong. You will. You will. Yeah. You will be dead. Yeah. They'll have to put them in the coffin beside you. The sweet cucumber I'm just pickle. giving them to friends and former colleagues. Right. <laughs> You've been a former colleague. And other people you don't like. Um, would you like to do Strictly, by the way? Oh, God, no. Can you dance? Mum dance? No. No? No. I mean, you dance like you dance in your kitchen, you know, when you think nobody else is looking. But um, mm, who would know? Who would know? I took skating lessons once. But, I mean, that's nothing to do with dancing, is it? <laughs> it's nothing to do with dancing. Is it? The thing that bothered me the most was whether I was going to have to put on the sexy face. You know, because Christ. obviously a lot of... Do you have to do that? Well, yeah, if you were doing a tango or you were doing some of these other dances that you were supposed to be alluring. Oh, to get back so, to the Ian, how many, 40 I, years ago. Could, could I see your sexy face? Well, now that I've just eaten oat cakes and they're stuck around yeah, my teeth. Yeah, go on. Give me a, <laughs> give me a smouldering look. Let me just, a uh, smouldering look. Come on. So do you have to raise one eyebrow? You Actually, me? no. The only other look I've got is a raised lip that goes ra- with the raised eyebrow. <laughs> like you're sticking so you a needle a through it, you know, and... <laughs> No, I don't think I've got a smouldering. Come on, uh, give it a go. What a sexy look! Mm. I haven't got a sexy look. Oh well, we're just I... bloody useless, aren't we? There we go. Yeah. yeah, you need to be in the moment, don't you? Anton will want to see your sexy look. There's 
no doubt about it. And, I don't think and, he will. I think that's probably got <laughs> enough going on in his life without me needing <laughs> to see my sexy look. Uh, my house hunting has started in earnest. Right. I actually can't believe you're saying this. What? Seriously, you're going to move from this rambling old freezing house. Yes. Seriously, Kate? I've had the estate agent round. Oh, my um, God. I've been looking at I am so excited. smaller flats. Um, Within the West End? Yep. Within yep, Glasgow, then? Yep, 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 yep. Tenement. Do I need... Bedrooms for my adult children. Oh, Christ, I. For God's sake, CSC, you're mad. Otherwise, you're in a one, <laughs> you're in a one bedroom and studio flat. But you're flat. never going to live with me again. They'll come and see you at Christmas, if you're lucky. If you cook something different from dried oat cakes and... Yeah. And dry see, I, I don't know whether I need, I need bedrooms for them. And of course you do. Why would you think that you wouldn't? Do you have any friends? Because they might come and stay. Well, would you, so do you think I need a two-bedroom, a three-bedroom? You need a three-bedroom. How many rooms have you got in this? Oh. Including bedrooms and public rooms and God knows rooms like this, what we're in at the moment. I don't even know what you'd call this. It's a bit of a jungle room. Yeah, yeah. Icebox. Um, yeah, absolutely three bedrooms. What are you thinking of? I kind of... Well, I don't know, maybe three bedrooms. It's funny, Charlie said to me, what does dad think about moving? Oh, right. And, um, and I said, I haven't asked him. You haven't asked him? I haven't asked him. What? You haven't asked him if he's interested in moving? Well, because he, he'll just go along with it. But oh I mean, when, I, when I did ask he'll him... He'll go along with it. Yes, he'll go along with it. But when I did ask him, he said... The dynamics in your house are really even. Yeah, well, he wanted to... He said, well, no, I think we should stay here. I quite like it. And I said, well, what are we going to heat this big room, this big house with? You know, it'll cost a fortune. He says, well, we'll just stay in two rooms. Oh my God, what a miserable, <laughs> you in one room and him in the other, and him heating the tennis ball, batting off the walls to keep warm. <laughs> so we're moving, whether he likes it or not. Oh, Jesus, oh, yeah, I'm delighted about this. I know, I know, I know. So Anton is still on the way up, which is interesting. Of course, he's only 57, so. Um, he's a young thing. We are a bit cheeky in terms of asking him to do this podcast at all. Yeah, I know, um, I'm surprised that he's agreed. But it's quite funny, I think you're you're just announced that you're going to be a granny, hopefully. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sell the house to mm-hmm. downsize mm-hmm. and, you know, because my kids are, are going to leave home. And Anton has still got the little ones. Oh so God, it's quite know. interesting that the three of us are within six years of each other. And yet we're all at phenomenally different oh stages God, of life. Oh, my God, that's true, actually. Yes. So my daughter is 33. Your Charlie's 21. Yeah. And Anton's children are six, is Six it? or seven. Six, six or seven. God, He'll tell us in a minute. That's incredible, isn't it? There you go. Right, email of the week, and then we're going to speak to Anton. Right. Email this is of from the week. Jenny Goodall. Right. And I Hi, like Jenny. this. I like this because it's um, along the house moving theme. Mm. She says, is this a common thought? Mm-hmm. Since turning 60, when I look around my home and I see things that I'd like to renew, my first thought is, will I get the use out of that? Mm is really sad. I'd like to change the wooden floors, but with the costs involved, would I get that much enjoyment out of it for the number of years I have left? It is very scary. I wonder if other people have this as their first thoughts. Oh my God. No, you could start thinking that a bit close then. You'd never buy any clothes in your pants. I know, I know. But if you want like 15 years out of a kitchen and you think, well, I'm 65, am I going to make it to 80? Is it worth having a new kitchen? Oh, absolutely. Every time. If you get joy from being in that kitchen, absolutely. And did you say about floorboards? My wooden floors change the wooden floors. Oh God, you know what? Absolutely go at life is short. You need to live in the moment. You need to do what makes you happy. When did you turn into a lifestyle guru? Yeah. So you're you not go, exactly. Can I not tell you about my other new job that I've got? <laughs> I thought Gwyneth Paltrow had walked in the room. Um keep your emails coming. Podcast at htb60.com. We'll speak to Anton Dubeck after this. Now, I've just noticed a sign behind you. Yes. How to be 60. The only reason I came on to do this with you is because I thought the, the name of the show is How to Be Sexy. <laughs> and I've got completely the wrong end of the stick here, haven't I? <laughs> what did you think of Karen's smouldering look? I, I was ever so slightly aroused. <laughs> but, but don't blame me. I'm only a man. I can't, can't be probably helps. But... It is uh, It is interesting. Jenny was go- looking around the house, uh, looking at something to renew, and she plumped, what did she plump for? The wooden, the wooden floors. The wooden floor. I, I, I thought for a second she was going to say husband. 
<laughs> and I uh, and and I'm I'm so pleased she didn't, and she went for the floors because uh, I think I think I'm with you, uh, Karen. Go for the floors, do it. Do you remember those days? We could wander into a house with a shag pile carpet. Loved oh, it. Oh, you'd, you'd kick your shoes off, and you'd have the fibres running through your toes. Do oh, you know the- this? Once my mum asked me if I wanted for my birthday carpet for my bathroom, and then it would go up the side of the wall. Yes. Oh. And I thought on two levels, hello, it's my birthday. Why would I want something for the house for my birthday? Now, this was oh. the seven, late 70s. And uh, oh my God. And a shag pile one it was as well. It was green. I didn't go for it, but she had it all in her mind what she was going to get. Yeah. Well, you see, you should, I think you should have gone for it really for a bit. <laughs> my mum once had an orange shag pile carpet and a black velour couch in the shape of a cloud oh right god how very trendy pretty hip eh? i mean that is something that is that's tremendous <laughs> do you remember when bean bags were all the rage yes whoever thought that would be a good idea <laughs> the auntie vi once flopped into one we couldn't get her out for three months it was a disaster <laughs> very low very low imagine one burst as well and do you remember when futon was all the rage everyone wanted to buy a futon <laughs> yes. oh come on lovely well, as a former bed salesman, Anton, you'll know all about it. Oh, so you. Did you do that? Yeah. Oh, yes, madam. I used to sell beds. Don't worry about it. Oh, I was very good at selling the old beds. I won't deny. I was. I had, I had quite the penchant for selling a bed. You could oh. sell anything. Did you ever well, sell a futon? <laughs> sell futons. Futons were very popular for a while. I never understood why. And it was very, very odd. It was very, very trendy. At the same time as... as um. As, uh, do you remember when we had hi fis like a stack system with a yes. graphic equaliser that didn't do anything? It was tremendous. It was a, it was an incredible time. Isn't it funny? You were saying earlier, I was going to say about that too, about you being of of similar vintage, although I'm obviously look at me, and <laughs> um, uh, but in very different stages. So you've I've got you were six year olds. My my twins are six, or our twins are six. Uh, and yours are all flying the nest and off they've gone uh-huh. and, and starting their own thing up. And it's really, really interesting. I'm, uh, you're downsizing. I'm going to be working till I'm a thousand. So it's... You it are. Is, it's, it, it, I know. <laughs> no one ever mentions how expensive it all is. They reckon love will conquer all. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it's all <quite> expensive. <laughs> so, I mean, I, well, how does it feel to have six-year-old twins then at 57? Well, it is the best thing in the world, I have to tell you. It is the most incredible thing ever. I love, I'd have them again, we, we, literally, because uh, I don't know if you know, we, we, we did, we went through IVF, Hannah and I, and Hannah and I, I love it as I, I sort of, yeah. Yeah, I went through IVF, no, I didn't, and uh, <laughs> she did. I was I did something in a dish for about a minute and a half. That was my job dealt with. And she was really did the heavy lifting. So we went through that whole process. Anyway, the other day I got an email from the clinic who have still got Ooh. some of the, the uh, swimmers the there. In, yeah, in a, a got some of the swimmers there in a in a in a frozen test tube saying, What do you want to do with these? I did have a look at uh, Hannah and I went, How's it going again? <laughs> She went, no. <laughs> so I love it. I, I mean, I'd do it all again, really. I mean, if I was younger and wealthier, I'd do it all again. So when it's your first time, you don't, you don't know what to expect. And it was just the most remarkable and brilliant thing. Ever. I, I, I have nothing but, and I use the word admiration, it doesn't seem like a big enough word for you girls in general, and especially if you're having babies and stuff, because... It is the most incredible, remarkable, amazing, fantastic, wonderful thing that you do. And then when you go IVF, it's just, you know, I've spoken about this before, but it is an incredible journey as well because you always feel, uh, for me, there's this wonderful thing, and I've said this before, but you know the dandelion fuzz? Yeah. yeah. You pick it up and you, and you blow it in the dam. Well, I always felt like I was holding it in the palm of my hands when Hannah was, and, and the babies were born, and I just didn't want it to go, in the breeze and it felt like such a delicate and they're not you guys are so robust and magnificent and i just felt like i wanted to scoop it it, with you all up really and just keep it together because what else could i do i just think you're amazing and i love it 
and I loved it from a bit. And they go, they say things like, oh, how old are they? They go, six. Oh, it's a lovely age. And I go, yeah, it is a lovely age. And I was just checking to a friend of mine the other day, he's got four-year-olds, and I went, oh, that's such a lovely age. And I, I've decided they're all lovely ages. Had you always wanted children? N- not massively. But I was always, you know, I always felt that this wasn't a decision for me to have to make in that regard. It was sort of there. But the one thing I did know was this, that if I did have children, it would have to be with a person that I'd want to spend the rest of my life with. And then it would feel like the, the right and the thing, not the thing to do, but it would be sort of perfect. And I found that in Hannah. I met Hannah and, decided, and realised I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. And then having children was was something that we both wanted to do. Um, even though we were a bit older. And it's just the most brilliant thing that we've ever done and the most brilliant thing I will ever do. I love every second of it, I can't tell you. I do a lot of touring and going around and doing shows. So I won't do a residences, let's say. So I won't do uh, a show that will leave me in a theatre somewhere for a week, eight shows a week, maybe in Newcastle or Manchester or something. So I have to stay away. I tend to do a show, do one night, so I'll come home after every show. So that I'm in at least in the morning, I'll be home and I'll see the children before they go off to school or if they're on holiday or something like that. Even if I if I can't be there in the evening. So for example, I've I haven't got a show today is great because I, I'm here. They came home from school. We did some reading together. We have we have dinner together. They'll we'll do bedtime. Jump in the bath. They'll jump in the bath. We do, you know. And it's one of my favourite things in the world is brushing my daughter's hair. Oh, I love that. I just love brushing. Darling, let me go and brush your hair. Oh. Come on, let me brush your hair. Oh, okay. This is her six year old, and she'll stand in front of me, and I'll, and I'll brush her hair. Or if if like, we do hair wash, uh, if we wash, yeah, bath and have wash the hair. I love blow drying the hair. I love that. Funny. Were you ever a player? Were you ever? No, not. I don't know. I don't know what that means. He says sort of naively. Two things. One, it came to me later. So I wasn't 22. So, for example, when I became sort of well-known for doing, on telly, let's say, so recognisable, I wasn't 22, 21. Some of the young guys that come on Strictly Now, and they're all sort of gorgeous and fabulous and <laughs> firm to the touch and all that. So that wasn't me. I was, I was already in my, I was about 36, I suppose. I was a ballroom dancer. I was very driven I knew exactly what I was trying to do in life and where I was trying to get to and very determined in that regard I I had no desire to be famous and also Strictly I was in the first series of Strictly so everybody comes in Strictly now knows what it's all about and sees the professional dancers all being well known and, and quite famous and go I'd like a bit of that please and they go they come into that with sort of an agenda. I suppose it's a bit like anything, really, that was the first, anything like Big Brother or Love Island or any of those sorts of shows where you you come from not being known to transported into everybody knows you, especially strictly 10 million viewers, 15 million viewers. Bosh, you're there. Everybody knows you. In the first year, nobody knew what that would be. After a few years, people, you know, you as a professional dancer, you go, oh, hello. Uh, I'd like to get a bit on that show because I'd like to become well known. You know, when we started Strictly Come Dancing, we just wanted to do a great job and be brilliant and win. That was fundamentally it. And then we carry on with the rest of our lives. Would you have liked it earlier? No, I'd have hated it. I wanted it exactly where it came. And you know what they say about be careful what you wish for and and fate and all those sorts of things, history and looking back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I wouldn't have been ready to have children earlier. Having children early would have been a disaster. So 50 was the perfect age to have children. Strictly come dancing for me at 26 as opposed to 36 would have been a disaster. Mm. I was a complete lunatic and an idiot. And meeting Hannah earlier in my life would have been a shame because I, I feel like I met her at the perfect time. For me and her, probably. Now I say this, and I don't mean it to be a bit there or anything, but for me it's like a fairy tale. It's perfect. Maybe I'm an old romantic, I don't know. But it's just perfect. I have to tell you, I just think she's wonderful. How would you describe Hannah? I think she's wonderful. Oh, golly. I mean, it's interesting you said you didn't have a a desire explicitly to be famous, but you've always been driven. 
Yeah, because I was competing as a dancer in in the day, in back in the day. So Aaron and I, for example, we danced together for about twenty five years, and we competed for many many years. But we travelled around the world, so we were driven to become world champions or be the best we could be. When Strictly came, Strictly Come Dancing came along, you know, you go to the same mentality. You don't change it. Oh, this is just a bit of fun. Well, no, not at all. Actually, this has got to be right. You've got to do the best you can. On my dressing room door, it says Anton Devet, professional dancer. Well then be the professional dancer. Make sure you do the right job. And also, if I was dancing with you, for example, I'd hate it if you look back and went, oh, I wish I hadn't danced with him. I wish he didn't try very hard. He didn't want to... You, I'd want you to have the best experience that you could have possibly had, however long it lasted. And that's my job. My job is not enough to be Anton de Beck, professional dancer, or Anton de Beck, judge. So that's the bit we want to see. So do that well. And then the rest of it will just... It will happen. Everything else happens around it. So you said you're a bit of an idiot at 26. What made you a bit ah. of an idiot? Lunatic. I was so driven and so determined. It was almost destructive, really, because I would, I, I was like a lunatic. I was like an absolute. What do you mean? I know what you mean. What do you I mean? don't know. I don't know. Really, just I get so frustrated and get so angry all the time. Come right. on, come on. And I just hate. It's in everybody. It's in everybody. I just wanted to beat everybody. But it was a really competitive world. I didn't want any friend. I didn't want to be a friend. No interest, not at all. I wanted to beat you. Badly. Really, really badly. I wanted to beat you a lot. Never wanted to, to give point it. That it was destructive for you, do you think? Yeah, because it was, you know, because your frustration takes over. And when frustration takes over, you've got no chance, really, because you can't see. When you get blinded by something, whatever it is, desire, temptation, determination, frustration, you're done for, aren't you, really? The whole point of being blind is you can't see, and you've got to be able to see. You've got to be able to see what you're trying to do, what path you're on, what the right thing to do is. You've got to, be, you've got to, you've got to understand what's going on. So when you were a lunatic, when you were in your mid-20s or whatever, did you have time for relationships? Like, no, no bit, time. Not, no, no partner, no girlfriend, no. no. No, I couldn't be doing with any of that. That was a distraction. Oh, no. Right. What do they used to call the boxers? No, they weaken the legs. Can't have any of that. Hanky, panky, not for a big fight. No, weakens the legs. <laughs> but no, it was, the thing for me was time. I didn't have time to devote to uh, things, anything outside of what I was trying to do. Time was of the essence, really. I needed to be rehearsing, practicing. We used to call it just practicing. Now, it's, now it's rehearsals. But in those days, it was practicing, practicing, having lessons, and working during the day, earning money, trying to sell in beds, whatever it was I was doing, uh, trying to earn money to, and then straight out of there. Because if I wasn't doing it, it'd be somebody from Estonia or Bulgaria or Italy or up the road in Sheffield, or be somebody somewhere practicing, having a lesson, and I was. Um. At the pictures, smooching. No. So where were you trying to get to? What was the goal? To win. Yeah. Winning was everything. That was the whole point of it. It wasn't to earn money because we couldn't earn any. Ball dancing competitions don't, you don't have prize money, really. You might win a few quid if there's a decent sponsor, but nothing. You know, no one's retiring on it. You might get, you might get your train fare home. But you're winning. It's, old, it's proper competing for trophies and reputation, really. And prestige, and I am the champ. And, that's, and where did all uh, this anger come from, though? I mean, it's just it was it was determination, really. It was it was really being driven, just being driven, really. I never used to mind not winning. That never used to bother me because you don't win all the time. Anybody says he wins all the time is a liar. You lose more often than you win, and you've got to know where you are in the world. I couldn't win because I wasn't good enough, but I could make the semi final. That right. would be good. And then I, if I make the semi-final regularly enough, I could make the final. Good. And then once I've made the final, I could come fifth or second and eventually win. So you, it's, it's a stepping stone. I didn't mind not winning. I couldn't abide dancing badly. I couldn't abide that. I used to hate bad dancing in myself or us as a couple. Used to drive me mad I, that's the bit i couldn't stand so that was that was where my frustration came from doing it not doing it well. 
You're such a different person. What happened between then and now? That was strictly John Darson. I remember, so I'm I'm this guy, the competitive guy, this guy, lunatic, eyeballs out, everything 100 miles an hour, come on! And then I walk into the studio with Leslie Garrett, day one, rehearsal. And the winning wasn't important to me, really, because I'd like to have won it. Fine, I'd like to have won it, but it wasn't important because it wasn't about me. And there were two things I realised immediately, and I'm really pleased about that because they had cameras on us all the time. I thought to myself, you're going to have to be yourself. Don't try and be Fred Astaire or somebody else. Don't try and be suave. and Don't try any of that. Just be yourself. And if people think you can be, you know, funny at times or whatever, if people sort of get you, then okay. If they, if they think you're an ass then fine, but just be yourself. And secondly, it's not about you. But it's it's so interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, from that person, that very determined tunnel vision, you know, competitive to the point of frustration guy mm. in your late 20s to, to the very relaxed, sort of philosophical, easygoing guy that we see now. And I say, well, what's, you know, affected that transition? You say Strictly. But Strictly could have turned you into a giant pillock. <laughs> Could have turned oh, you I could have been the eagle. biggest band in the world, but I, it wasn't really my thing because I was I wasn't that interested in all that. I just I I you know I just loved doing it. I mm. loved doing it. I was I've always been the sort of person that goes all that other stuff will either happen or won't happen, whatever that might be. What's the expression? I, I've never sort of chased fame. Does that make sense? You know, I it's all about me being famous. I've never really, that's never been the point. I've always tried to be, my goal is always try to be brilliant, try to, as, you, as you can be, try to be that. The other stuff either comes or doesn't come. I can't, I've no, because I have no control over it. I don't have control over me. I'm still fiercely determined. Nothing has changed in that regard, but the frustration is not there. But now you are famous. You're very <laughs> famous and well, your well. you know national treasure status, etc. Are you loving that? Yeah, <laughs> I love it because I I love it, what I do. I love, you know, Brucey was always my great hero, and I one of the greatest pleasures I've ever had in in my life, really, not just professional life, but was spending time with Brucey and getting to know Brucey and becoming friends with Brucey. I don't know. I feel so uh what would be the word? Not proud, I can feel proud about it, but sort of blessed. Honored? Blessed, honored. Yeah, perfect. About that. Because I've loved I love show business. I've always loved it. Even when I was, you know, young growing up and watching things on the TV, the Royal Variety Show was one of my favorite shows of all time. I loved the Royal in the old days. And I love show business. My favorite thing on the telly growing up was all that sort of stuff. Do you remember Morecambe and Wise? Used to have their show, and it was the play that I wrote. Oh dear. The you know, the, and they used to do these things with these great stars. The stuff with Shirley Bassey, where she put her foot through the stair. The stuff with Glenda Jackson, with that, and all those sorts of things. And also Bruce. Angela Rippon. Who, Angela Rippon did it, and and the wonderful uh, Brucey used to do that number at the end of the Gen game, where he used to have the contestants. He'd be like a like a play thing, and he'd be in and out of cupboards and all that sort of stuff, reading, and they'd read the script wrong because they the, the script they wrote. He'd obviously put the punctuation in the wrong places, so it, it, they read it funny, and he'd he'd read it out for them. I love that stuff, and a, and a, and a song and dance man. Of course, Fred Astaire is my great hero. The song and dance man was always what well, wanted to be really. The closest thing I could find to it was was ballroom dancing. So really, it was all of my dreams come true. I mean, and we're not going to get into Anton because I know you don't want to. We've had the life stories thing. We know you had a very difficult relationship with with your dad, and he wasn't encouraging at all in terms of that. Who was encouraging you, or were you having to make it all happen on your own? Well, you did it on your own, but that that was how, as it's supposed to be, as far as I could see. My mum was encouraging because, but she was working two jobs. So she loved it, but she never she never actively took part in it. She didn't drive, so I wasn't she wasn't driving me to competitions and lessons and stuff. I find my own way there, but she'd fund it. She'd have to pay for it all, uh, and I couldn't have done it without my mum. So my mum is the is the number one, really. Uh, and even now, she's you know she's great and stuff. She comes and sees me, and if she's around, I'll get her into the theatre and watches the shows and stuff. So it was all it only happened because of my mum, but. 
you do it yourself, really. And also at the time where people didn't know about ballroom dancing or care about ballroom dancing. So I never discussed it with anyone. I just did it because I was doing it because I wanted to do it and I did it for me anyway. So, But now that you're a dad, mm. you know how much of a big deal that is because you wouldn't want your kids to do it on their own, would yeah. you? No, not no, but it it was it's a different you know different time and everything. So I love doing things with my children. So for example, my I, my children, I, they're just you know learning how to play stuff like golf and stuff. So we we're we're down at the driving range hitting golf, playing golf together. There's nothing quite like that. But they, you know, they'll get to an age where they want want to do stuff. They want to do stuff on their own with their pals and stuff. And eventually, I suppose, you'll know this better than I, they'll come out the other end of that and they'll want to do stuff together again. But, um, yeah, at the moment, it's just magical. Are you pleased that the kind of dad that you've turned out to be? I don't know. I, I, didn't, know whatever, I, I didn't, didn't know whatever other option there was available, really. It's the most wonderful thing, having the children and being with the children. And Hannah and I together, I'm going to say I, I mean I as in the greater I, Hannah and I together, we we just love doing it, really. We don't really want to, you know, it's because we're older parents, I suppose. We don't want to do that thing where they'll go and stay with nanny and granny and granddad for a couple of months and we'll go off to the south of France for a couple of days. No, we'll do that together. If we go to south of France, we'll go together. Love doing stuff for the four of us. And the children love it as well. So it's sort of the best of times, really, in that regard. And I was going to say, and I'm not going to try and make you talk about the, the past at all, but I did want to say, you know, having watched the life stories, and, you know, you and I have met, obviously, a number of times over the mm. years. And, you know, there is no one in the business who's got a bad word to say about you because you are always a, a lovely guy to, to everyone. But, you know, of course, I think, oh, well, is he just one of those people who's nice all the time and, and that's it? But watching that life stories... I, you know, having always liked you, I, I did have, you know, a real respect and admiration for you because clearly it wasn't the easiest of start. And and funny enough, we've spoken to Craig River Horwood on this podcast as well, who also had a, another difficult start. Mm. And both of you have somehow taken that bad energy and turned it into good energy. And, and not everyone manages to do that. Well, thank you. I love you i know it's sudden i can't help it it's just the way i feel um it's difficult really because you sort of i don't want to be flippant about it really but i i i wasn't quite sure what the other option was really i can only speak about it personally and what i do and this is and i don't want anybody to think oh it's all right for you or whatever um i'm i'm literally only talking about me and everybody must do what they do but for me it was it was only ever just about moving forward i had no desire for anything to define me because it it was not about that it was because i knew what i wanted to do all this other stuff was just sort of noise really and and was over there but it wasn't shaping me in any way so it was just in the way, really. It's just a bit of a pain. So um, it wasn't going to shape me or or make me more determined to do something because of. I would say it had no effect on me whatsoever in regards to the decision I made moving forward. So it, it didn't influence me in any decision I made moving forward, if right. you like. So whatever happens, happens. because. I was only ever about moving forward, about the future, never about the past. The past is the past. So I just move on. Because I don't want anything, I don't want anything that's gone past in the past to spoil what might happen in the future. And I thought that would be a shame mm -hmm. if something potentially nice that might happen gets spoiled because of something that happened before, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with you anyway. It was, uh, with, with somebody else's actions and behaviour, not mine. I, and I say this and I don't mean to be flippant about it, but I know people who have had other difficult times and situations in their life and it has uh, had a bigger effect on them moving forward and they haven't been able to do the things that I've said that I was able to do and I almost wish I could help. You know, I just feel like I want to, sometimes I feel like I just want to put my arm around people and go, come with me, be fine. 
And that's how I've always felt, really. Come on, come with me. No, no, come with me. That's it. There you go. No, no, don't look back. Look, this, this is the way forward. And we go. And just do that. That's all I feel that we need to do sometimes. Just do that. Arm round. Come on, old love. Off we go. And then away you go. Well, hopefully it will be fine. Mm, yeah. Oh. And so what what do you want to see in front of you? I mean, you're doing so much. You say you're doing, you know, your own shows, shows with Giovanni. You've got a book out, um, another another book out. Um, yeah, The Paris Affair. The Paris Affair, yeah. Um, that's your sixth, well, seventh book, but sixth in the series. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, you know, I, I like to do the things I love to do. And I love to write novels, uh, tell stories. I love being out in front of an audience. You know, it's funny, actually, I do a show. I do an evening with, for example, and I, I we have the wonderful orchestra, the fabulous Lance Ellington, some incredible dancers. We sit, we dance and sing, and we chat with the audience, answer questions. And basically, it's, it, that's all my favourite stuff in the world. And then I'll come out on stage and we'll do some stuff. But, we'll have, but what we'll have is a great time. We'll laugh and we'll have great music and there'll be beautiful dancing and we'll have a lovely time and we'll tell some stories. We might not tell some stories. We'll answer some questions. But all in all, it will just be the best of nights. And that, for me, is what it should be. Mm. And then we'll make some TV and we'll do some shows. Mm. Fabulous. It's lovely to hear you so positive. Well, it's I'm the luckiest guy in the world, really. Yes. Look at me. I've got the best wife. I've got the most gorgeous children. I hate this because it sounds like I'm showing off. And I'm not. But And I know it's difficult. People have difficult times and difficult lives and stuff like that. But everyone has their, everyone has their own thing. I had, I had demons on my shoulders. I, when I was used to compete, it's so funny. When I used to compete, I used to think everybody else had it easier than me. And I used to look at people and they come out with their nice suit on and look at their perfectly cut hair. And that girl he's dancing with, she looks amazing, fabulous frock and her hair's all perfect, smiley face, gorgeousness. And they were having the best life. Look at them laughing. Oh, how I'd like to laugh. And all of but they all had their, everyone's got their demons. Everyone's got their thing. Mm. They seem to have more money than me. Oh, I spoke to some guys later on in life and they didn't have a pot. Oh, I struggled from week to week with my... Everybody's got their thing, mm. but nobody cares about your thing because mm-hmm. everyone's got their own thing. So there's no point of complaining, is it? Crap I know, thing. but it's the fact that you made the transition because you're right. So many people go through life with a sense of grievance. They've got it better than me. Oh, it's all right yeah. for you. Oh, he can talk. And they tend to go through their entire life with that. Can the you? fact that you had it up until a certain stage and then you somehow managed to shed it, that's the remarkable bit. Well, I, yeah. I, I think you just do. I think you, I mean, no one cares. That's the big thing. Right? No, I mean, you walk on stage, you, you walk out on stage, and it, it, you know, I feel a bit down tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, goldfish got flushed down the toilet. I'm a bit sad. No one cares. Mm. Like, oh, right, on with the show. Come on, sing something. Yeah, it's still busy. <laughs> and you've got, you've, got, you've, got, you've got to go, come on, I'll play me fiver. I want to see a show. All right, I'm all right. I'm just, <laughs> take it away, fellas. And on you go. It's showbiz. You've got to, you've got to perform. You've got to do what you said you'd do. So do it. Fulfill the bargain. Right, we're going to play a quick game of Big Six or Bingo. We just need two numbers from you between one and 60 and right. two random questions. 57. Let's start with that one. Right. He hates it when it's a late number. Um, oh, I don't know if this is... Um, prefer to sleep alone or with someone. So do you oh, quite like right. a night on your own or not? No, I prefer to sleep my wife. <laughs> no, I'll do that. I'll tell you what I like to do. Obviously, you know, when we go to bed, we'll have a special cuddle. Just saying. And <laughs> that will take a couple of minutes. And then I like to sleep. And then I sleep on this side, and my wife sleeps on Hannah sleeps on that side. My left side, by the way. People who can't see this because it's a podcast. And so she sleeps on my left. And I like just to put my hand on her bottom. Is this a naked bottom? Yeah, oh, naturally. Just on on the uh, on the if she's laying away from me on the on the right cheek, buttock. I just put my hand on my right cheek, my buttock, and I like to do that. So if I sleep on my own, it's not the same. 
Well, it was, I've, when I've, it was touched, I've touched my own buttocks over the years. Now. I don't, <laughs> I'm bored of that now. Slightly hairier. Right, another number. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you've seen them as well, have you? Um, have, well, I have six then. Uh, 16 or 60. Would you prefer to be 16 or 60? Going back to then or not? I mean, I'd like to be 16 for all the reasons that you'd want to be 16 because you've got all your life ahead of you. But yeah, I can't imagine being a teenage boy. It's I think about when I was 16 and if if I could have said to my 16-year-old self, when you get to 57, you'll be doing this and that. And I'll, I'd be absolutely delighted. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'd be absolutely delighted about that. Yeah. Because it would have been exactly what I'd wanted to be doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anton, listen, thank you so much. We've made a good dark behind you, so we better let you go. God, yeah. Now you'll find the children are actually upstairs uh, going to bed. So if we chat a bit longer, I went and... <laughs> oh, in the bathroom now. Oh, what a shame. Oh, so oh. I to take up your time. So much of your time, but thank you. No, no, you're great. Next week, the contrast could not be greater. We're joined by the Chief Instructor on Channel 4's Celebrity SAS. Billy Billingham. Stand by your beds. No time to relax. Subscribe to the Hypno SOS podcast. It's calming, effective, and best of all, it's short around 10 minutes so you can always find time to listen. So, if you need help with sleep, reducing anxiety, or letting go of stress, or you just need a boost, Hypno SOS is for you. Written and presented by a therapist with over 30 years' experience, Ursula James, that's me, by the way, its weekly episodes contain deep relaxation and powerful and highly effective suggestions to help you get control in your life. With around 200 episodes to choose from and new ones each week, you'll definitely find something that will appeal to you. It's not hypnosis. It's Hypno SOS. And in case you just zoned out there, I'll spell it for you. H-Y-P-N-O-S-O-S. Available on all the usual platforms. Go on, give it a try.